In the Second World War, tanks dominated the battlefield, with hundreds of thousands used by both the Axis and Allies throughout the six year struggle. Since their development in 1915, tanks have come a very long way, and few are more iconic than the Soviet T-34. This video is going to look at the development of the T-34, its combat role, and assess how effective it was as a main battle tank. The T-34's origins began in the Spanish Civil War, where Soviet volunteers supported the Republicans, augmented by shipments of tanks. These were mostly T-26s and the BT family of light cavalry tanks. Unfortunately, Stalin's purges of the Red Army resulted in an inexperienced and sometimes incompetent officer cadre who didn't understand the full potential of mechanised warfare. The Soviet armour, little changed since the First World War, took heavy losses at the hands of the German 37mm guns used by the Spanish Nationalist Army. Further, in 1938 and 1939, fighting against the Japanese, the Lake Kassan and Kalgil Gol, demonstrated the inadequacies of the BT-5 tanks on a modern battlefield. Their engines in particular were vulnerable to critical fires when ignited by Japanese artillery, mines and infantry weapons. These lessons required a new solution, and three projects for an up-armoured and up-gunned main battle tank emerged by the end of 1937. Of these, the ISDEL I-115 relied on a multi-turreted design that was ultimately rejected as archaic, and although the T-46-5 had a greater armour with a single turret, it was not accepted for production. The third of these projects was designated the A-20, which was a light tank designed to replace the BT-5s, and was developed by the Kharkov locomotive plant. However, this was based on the design of the BT-5 and was still under armoured. In early 1937, the Kharkov plant was devastated by political arrests that included the head of design for the BT tanks and many of the plant's talented designers. In the wake of these arrests, the A-20 project was then taken over by a young designer named Mikhail Koshkin. Koshkin rethought the entire A-20 project and identified the flaws inherent in the design. Using his initiative, Koshkin and his design team developed a new vehicle designated as the A-32. Not only was the armour increased from 20 to 32 mm, hence the name, but the main armament was also upgraded from a 45mm gun to a 76.2mm gun. Also added was a smaller and more powerful diesel engine, which did away with the danger of the previous petrol engines encountered in Spain and the Far East. The A32 project also abandoned the wheel and track design of the BT series, which was intended for long road travel to save wear and tear on the tracks. In practice, this was very rarely used as it was a complicated process, and it also added expense and weight to the suspension. In 1938, the two designs of the A-20 and the A-32 were presented to Joseph Stalin and the Defence Committee of the USSR. Although the A-32 wasn't in keeping with the original design directive of the Council, Stalin authorised construction to begin on both designs of prototypes. After testing on the proving grounds at Kubinka, the Council and Stalin greenlit the A-32 and abandoned the A-20. The tank was designated by Koshkin as a T-34, which commemorated the 1934 state decree which announced the expansion of Soviet armed forces. It also made reference to the 1934 start of Sergei Ordhonetsky's leadership of the tank production program, and also the year when Koshkin had had his initial ideas about developing the vehicle. The two prototypes of the T-34 were completed by January 1940, and were driven from Kharkov to Moscow for a demonstration for the Kremlin. From there they drove to Finland, but arrived too late to take part in the Russia or Finnish war. They were then driven back to Kharkov via Minsk and Kiev, demonstrating their incredible durability. Dual training sessions between Germany and Russia meant that the Red Army had acquired several Panzer III's. According to the German military liaison officers in Moscow, they were the best of the German armour. They were immediately tested against the T-34 and were found to be inferior in firepower, armour and mobility. Despite the positive results of the testing, unfortunately Koshkin would die before production of his vehicle went into full flow. The extreme winter driving on the prototype has taken its toll on him, and he died on the 26th of September 1940. More trouble was also to follow, as political infighting meant that of the 500 tanks ordered, only three had reached Red Army units by September of 1940, and in total, only 115 were manufactured by the end of the year. With the infighting resolved, a production order of 2,800 tanks was agreed for 1941, with developments in the suspension and the increase in the armour from 40 to 60 mil. When the German army began its invasion of Soviet Russia on the 22nd of June 1941, there had been a production run of 1,225 T-34s. However, only 967 had actually been delivered to units. Prior to the invasion, the Soviet tank forces were undergoing massive changes in 1941 in an attempt to mirror the success of the German panzer forces in the preceding two years. 
The tanks were to be organised into nine tank corps of around a thousand tanks each, but only five actually received any great numbers of T-34 by June 1941. Although the Soviets organised 19,221 tanks in these ungainly mechanised corps, the vast majority were the older T-26 and BT fast tanks. These light cavalry tanks faced 3,050 German panzers, which were mostly modern designs. Although the T-34s and heavy KV-1s were more than a match for the German armour, incompetence in Soviet leadership meant that most T-34s went into action without armour-piercing rounds. Many carried only high explosive and even then without a full complement of ammunition. This was also compounded by the untested nature of the new Soviet tank and the lack of spare parts and recovery vehicles. The mechanised corps were also unready, being led by inexperienced commanders due to the fact that only one corps had seen any extensive manoeuvres. The T-34 was in action from the first day of the German invasion. The sloped armour caused consternation amongst the German infantry as their 37mm anti-tank rounds simply bounced off at ranges over 300 metres. The T-34s were able to withstand multiple hits from German anti-tank weapons, one reportedly being hit 23 times before the turret ring was jammed. Unfortunately, the crews were untested in battle and poorly trained in modern tank tactics. The Germans also switched to using the 88mm flak gun and divisional artillery in an anti-tank role to maintain some semblance of balance against the Soviet tanks, but these weapons were too thinly spread across the German front to have any major impact. Even the German panzers struggled in head-to-head -head duels with the T-34. Only hits on the drive sprockets and turret rings seemed to work. Added to this, the Panzer 3s and 4s were easily destroyed by the T-34's 76.2mm gun. Despite occasional local Soviet successes, the Panzer's superior tactical and strategic training allowed them to continue the drive to the east. The Panzers made mincemeat of the older Soviet tanks, with 16th Panzer Division claiming to have destroyed 293 enemy vehicles in their drive to Kiev. The massive encircling battles of 1941 blunted the Soviet superiority in numbers and despite the advanced technical aspects of the T-34, they were only fielded in small numbers with inexperienced crew. The initial impact of the T-34 was not the hammer blow hoped for, but it had been an unexpected result. The German frontline units clamoured for a German tank that would be able to cope with the Soviet beast. Some called for exact copies to be made, but the aluminium engine could not be mass produced in Germany. Also, the idea that the Third Reich might produce a tank designed by inferior slabs would not be acceptable in Hitler's racial ideology. These factors led to the development of the Panther tank. This vehicle would not see service until 1943, however, meaning the German frontline units would have to make do with it, incremental improvements on their Panther 3s and 4s for the time being. The devastation caused by the German victories in 1941 had another unforeseen impact. The tank factories were evacuated further east to new industrial towns in the Ural Mountains to prevent capture. This disrupted the production of the T-34 along with the cancelling of an upgraded version called the T-34M. However, efforts were made to reduce the manufacturing processes of the tanks in order to help stabilise the Red Army over the winter of 1941 and 42. For example, the original 1941 version of the F-43 gun had 861 parts while the 1942 production version had 614. Craftsmanship was abandoned, and some features were simplified or even omitted, halving the time needed for manufacture and slashing the price of each tank. Updates to the tank included thicker hull side armour from 40 to 45 mil, a new driver's hatch, and wider tracks for improved traction. These updates were all implemented from the shortcomings of the design that manifested themselves in combat. Although the Red Army never had a consistent way of tracking different designations of the T-34, this type has become known by historians as the T-34 M42. 1942 also saw reorganisation of the Soviet tank forces. The heavier and slower KV-1s were removed from tank brigades and formed into separate tank regiments as infantry supports. Also, the KV-1 production run was scaled back and the T-34s increased. By 1942, we also saw the high watermark of the German efforts in the east with the 6th Army attacking Stalingrad in the summer. Even with the Germans capturing the suburbs of the city, the Stalingrad tank factory continued producing T-34s until September. There is a legend that the last batch of tanks were rushed straight into the streets fighting without even being painted. Up to this point, the Stalingrad tank factory had produced 42% of all T-34s. Other tank factories were switched over completely from the KV-1 to produce the T-34 in order to balance the numbers after the loss of the Stalingrad tank factory. Throughout 1942, improvements were made to the T-34. One of these included a new hexagonal turret, which allowed more room for the crew along with an increase in ammunition storage. The gearbox was upgraded and a new air filter added. 
This version is referred to as the T-34M43. Despite all these changes, it was clear from the summer battles of 1943 that it was not the armour, but the gun of the tank which needed attention. By the middle of this year, the T-34 had lost its technical superiority to the German Tigers and Panthers, and the upgraded Panzer IV was now the equal of the T-34. However, the sheer numbers of available T-34s gave the Soviets the edge on the battlefield. Soviet tactical doctrine and training may not have been up to the levels of their German opponents, but the Red Army commanders realised that the struggle in the East would not be won by individual tank duels, but by weight of numbers. No matter how many Soviet tanks were destroyed, there was always more to fill the gaps. At the operational level, Soviet commanders were now demonstrating a greater or at least equal understanding of combined arms operations than their German opponents. Added to this, the German forces were stretched to breaking point during the massive battles at Kursk. The Soviet tactic of strength through numbers is soberly demonstrated when between July and September of 1943, around 9,000 Soviet tanks were destroyed against the German losses of around 2,200. However, the Soviet losses could be replaced, and with the Red Army now in control of the battlefield, damaged and destroyed tanks could be recovered and returned to the battle, with some individual T-34s being rebuilt on an average of four times. 1944 saw the introduction of the last version of the T-34, now upgraded with an 85mm gun, the T-3485. This version of the tank addressed the issue of firepower. The T-3485 was not an equal match for the Panther, but it outclassed the far more numerical Supanzer IVs and Stugs. This factor along with the introduction of the IS-2 heavy tank and the weight of numbers gave the Soviet tank forces the edge over the Panzers. By the end of the war, T-34 production totaled 35,120, along with 19,430 T-34-85s. These numbers absolutely swamped German tank production levels and overtook Sherman production totals, making the T-34 the most manufactured tank of the Second World War. As with any new design, the T-34 suffered from early issues and upgrades helped iron out problems as they were encountered. It was not a comfortable tank to drive, being as basic as possible to allow for quick and cheap production, and the main weapon was underpowered for much of the war. But the sheer weight of numbers of vehicles that were fielded gave the T-34 the combat edge, and this edge is what we mattered on the Eastern Front where thousands of tanks clashed. For this reason, the T-34 could be described as the most effective tank of the Second World War. Thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, please subscribe to the channel for more military history.